if you orient yourself ethically in the most fundamental sense, then in some sense you have the force of God on your side, and then maybe you can prevail despite the difficulty. And I think that's, I think that's right. I, 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 think it's, I think that's true. So, and you can ask yourself, I try to ask these questions seriously, you know, and I would also say that I've been driven to my religious beliefs such as it is by necessity, not by desire. Um, what do you want to have on your side when you're contending with the unknowable future and its vagaries? Uh, how about truth? How about beauty? How about justice? You want allies? Those are powerful allies. That's what the university is supposed to be teaching young people. It's like, you need some allies, man. Well, how about the pursuit of truth? Well, then the scientists have their say. And I would say on the economic front, well, how about the free trade between autonomous individuals? The free trade of goods of value be between autonomous individuals. That's not such a bad thing to have on your side, these eternal verities. And then we could say, perhaps, that, well, there is a set of eternal verities, but they're all eternal verity, so they share something in common, some good in common. All good things share some good in common. Well, what is the good that they share in common? Well, for all intents and purposes, that's God. And you might say, well, I don't believe in that. It's like, well, I don't know what you mean. You don't believe there's any such thing as good? You don't believe there's any such thing as ultimate good? I'm not trying to make some ontological claim about an old man living in the sky, although I think that's a lot more sophisticated concept than people generally realize. That's not my point. My point is, you do have a belief system, whether you know it or not. It's a system of ethics, whether you know it or not. There's either something at the bottom that unifies it, or it's not unified, which means you're aimless and hopeless and depressed and anxious and confused, because those are the only other options. And maybe you don't know what that unifying belief is, but that doesn't mean that it's not there, it just means you don't know what it is. And so I'm trying to puzzle out what it is, you know, I've, I could give you a couple of examples, very, very briefly, because I won't, so I, I already mentioned the Genesis, the, the story in Genesis, it associates God with the, the force process that generates habitable order out of chaos and attributes that nature in some sense to human beings. Um, in the next part of the story, in the story of Adam and Eve, um, God is what people walk with unselfconsciously in the garden. So Adam doesn't because he's now ashamed and he doesn't walk with God anymore. But so what is God? Well, that's what you walk with when you're unselfconscious. So that's an interesting idea. And then you have the God that manifests itself, himself, let's say, in the story of Noah, and that's the, that's the intuition that hard times are coming and that you better get your house in order. And you think, well, does that lead you, that intuition? Well, certainly sometimes, if you have any sense, it's like, well, what's the nature of the intuition? Is that a spirit that animates you? Well, obviously, because there you are acting, and so you're acting out a pattern. It's a spirit that animates you. And so, and then there's the story of the Tower of Babel, what's God there? Well, God is that which you replace at your peril because everything will come tumbling down. That's the Tower of Babel. It's like, well, is that true or not? You think about that for a week, especially in that light, you think, oh, definitely, if we put the wrong thing at the top, like Stalin, for example, then look out, and we've done that a bunch of times in the 20th century. I think, you know, Milton, conceptualized Lucifer as something like the spirit of unbridled intellectual arrogance. It's something like Lucifer is the light bringer, and he is engaged in a conflict with God, attempting to replace the divine. And that's pretty explicit in the story. And I look at that and I think, oh, that's a poetic intuition of the, of the battle between secular, the secular intelligentsia and the religious structure. That's Milton's prodroma. And what he sees happening is the intellect has become so arrogant that it will attempt to replace the divine and rule over hell. I think, yeah, well, that's the Soviet Union, man. That's Maoist China. We know. We know. We've got our theory. It's total. We've solved the problem and nothing's going to change. Fair enough. If you want to rule over hell and you think, well, these societies are successful. It's a pretty odd definition of success as far as I'm concerned. You want to be successful like China? You know, that's why it's true that 
man does not live by bread alone, you know. So, a wealthy slave, that's no life, man. Sp I spent a lot of time at the various universities I was associated with studying motivation for atrocity. Because I was very curious about that as a psychologist, not, not as a sociologist or an econom economist or a political scientist. Uh, you're an Auschwitz guard, okay, what's motivating you as an individual? And I wanted to understand it well enough so that I could understand how I could do that because one answer to that is, well, that sort of behavior is so far beyond the pale that it's completely incomprehensible. It's just a manifestation of, say, like intense psychopathy and a normal person can't even imagine it. And I think, no, nah, that evidence doesn't really suggest that because it isn't obvious that all the people involved in the Nazi movement, for example, were criminally pathological, that they were deviations, like what would incomprehensible deviations from the norm. It'd be lovely to think that, and it would make the world a lot simpler, but I think the evidence mostly suggests that, no, you can get ordinary people to do that sort of thing, and maybe even to enjoy it. And so that's pretty bloody terrifying. And so I tried to understand that, and I think I did to some degree, although we can't go into that. A fair bit of that's a consequence of envy. It's the spirit of Cain. I would say, if you had to sum it up in a phrase, but um, that isn't the issue. The issue is, how do you stop it from happening again? And because that's supposed to be what we're concentrating on, let's say, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Never forget, which should mean something like, how about we don't do this again? And so my, my question was, well, how do, we, how do we best go about that? Ensuring we don't walk down that road again. And my conclusion was, that's an because it, was an, because it was fundamentally an issue of individual psychology, most fundamentally, more than economics, more than sociology, all of that. It's, the cure is individual. People have to, they have to act as ethically as they are powerful, or else. And so I've been trying to convince people to do that, I suppose, or to put forward, not to convince them precisely, but to put forward an argument about why that's necessary and why it's on them. It's like, no, this is on you. You, you, don't, you, you got to understand this. This problem, it's you. You don't get it right, it isn't going to work. And so how do you do that? Well, you start with what you have under control in your own life. Because where else are you going to start? You look to yourself. Put your house in order. Don't be worried about some other person walking this satanic path. And that's what activists do all the time, right? It's you. It's the corporations. Like, it's someone else. No, no. It's you. And I think that's also fundamental to the Judeo-Christian doctrine, is that it's you. It's on you. Redemption's an individual matter. And so my hope is that if enough people take themselves with enough seriousness, then we won't end up in hell. Because we certainly could. It's, it's a high probability. And so, and I also don't think that you can be, or you can be motivated enough to put your house in order to the degree that's necessary merely by being attracted, let's say, to the potential utopia that might emerge as a consequence of that. So that'd be a vision of heaven, let's say. Mm -hmm. No, you need to also be terrified of hell. I think, well, there's no such thing. It's like, just because you haven't been there doesn't mean there's no such thing. It's like, you have to be pretty bloody naive to think there's no such thing. Like, how much evidence do you need? And how does it come about? Well, it comes about at least in partial consequence of the sins of men. And I think that's true. So I go around and I talk to people. I say, look, there's, there's not only more to you than you know. There's more to you than you can imagine. You have an ethical responsibility to act in that light. And you might claim not to believe that, but I would say, well, your whole culture is predicated on that belief, and insofar as you are an active member of that culture and a believer in its structure, then you believe it. You might not be very good at believing it, you might be full of conflict and doubt, and you might not be able to articulate it, but it's still right at the bedrock of your culture, this notion of, what, the divine sovereign individual, is that not what your culture is predicated on, that idea? The Logos, inherent in each person, it's something other than that? I've never seen a credible argument made to show that it's anything other than that. You know, you can say, well, rights are attributed to you by the state. It's like, 
sorry, that's a weak argument because the state's dependent on your actions. So, you know, to believe that, you have to believe that the state is the entity and that individuals are just subordinate in some fundamental sense to the state. It's like, no, the state is dependent on the individual to exactly the same degree. So, we're the active agent of the state, in some sense. We're the seeing eye of the state, the, the speaking mouth of the state. Because the state's dead without the individuals that compose it. Don't be thinking your ambition is corrupt. You know, because that's part of the message. Now, human beings, we're a cancer on the planet. We're headed for an environmental apocalypse. The entire historical structure is nothing but atrocity, etc., etc. Anyone with any ethical aim whatsoever is just going to pull back. You don't want to manifest any ambition, support the patriarchal structure, exploit the environment. You've got to crush yourself down. You shouldn't even have any children. It's like, no. There's no excuse for that. There's zero excuse for that. I saw a professor at, at an event, something like this. He came out and trumpeted this bloody, environmentally friendly house he'd built. And, you know, fair enough, man. It was a, it was a pretty interesting house. But not everybody had the $4 million that, that it took him to build it. And I'm not criticizing his money, even. It's like, he's had some money. Good for him. He built a house. Okay. But then to trumpet that as a moral virtue, well, you're pushing it there. And then he came out to all the kids and he said, you know, my wife and I decided that we were only going to have one child. And I think that's one of the most ethical things we could have possibly done. And I would strongly encourage you to do the same. I thought, you son of a... Get up in front of these young people. A lot of these kids were uh, children of first-generation immigrants from China. And, and he showed all these images, you know, of these terrible factories in China, these endless rows of sterile mechanism that were subordinating all the Chinese people to this terrible, you know, capitalist uh, machine. And I thought, you don't understand. Half the audience is looking at those factories and thinking, that's a hell of a lot better than struggling through the mud under Mao, buddy. And so... He, he, I don't know where he thought he was, but to come out in front of all those kids and basically tell them that the whole human enterprise is so goddamn corrupt that the best thing they could possibly do is limit their multiplication. And to think of himself as a scholar and an educator it was just, I did say something, by the way. It was rather uncomfortable and he stomped off the stage. But that's no message for young people. That's no, there's no excuse for that. And you think, well, I, you know, we're going to destroy the planet. We have to do this. We have to demoralize the youth to be ethical. It's like, yeah, really, that's your theory. You're going to demoralize young people to be ethical. That's your theory. It's like, you should go home and think about that for like a year. And I'm passionate about this, you know, because you have no idea how many people that's killing. You have no idea. I see people everywhere, all over the world, they're so demoralized, especially young people, especially young people with a conscience, because they've been told since they were little that there's nothing to them but corruption and power. It's like, how the hell do you expect them to react? You know, they, well, I shouldn't do anything, man, you know?